Our speaker for the second talk of the session is Thomas Lee, and he will be talking about lots of things about OpenStack. Take it away. Thank you, uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see so many people uh, wanting to know something about OpenStack. Just by a show of hands for a very scientific uh, survey, how many has heard about uh, OpenStack? How many of you have implemented OpenStack? Ooh, okay, and running OpenStack, obviously, a lot less. So the, your, your audience I'm aiming at for, uh, for this morning. So I'm the CEO at Wingu. We're a public cloud uh, part using OpenStack. And with me, I have uh, Stefan Ludic, who's our program manager. So if I get stuck in the questions, he's going he's gonna to give me a hand. So our OpenStack experience, uh, we've been playing with this stuff for about three and a half years. Uh, over the past two and a half years, we've been running OpenStack uh, in production, and we are an Ubuntu OpenStack uh, partner. We've gone through the pain of uh, upgrading OpenStack. I think if you want to put the fear into a cloud engineer, you have to say the word upgrade and OpenStack in the same, in the same sentence. So we've been through that, uh, doing a migration from OpenStack Juno release to currently the OpenStack Metaka release, which is a five-year long-term support release. Any code improvements that we make um, uh, for the benefit of the community, we actually upstream that via our cloud, cloud partner, um, Canonical. And then we also support the Tachyon uh, open source web framework uh, project. We've got some other guys in our team who will be showing um, a little bit about that uh, tomorrow. So, you know, a key question is always, what is OpenStack? And it's really cloud control software that allows you to control vast amounts of compute, storage, and networking resources. Key here is, is that OpenStack is not a product. You can't go and download an ISO, click next, 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 and um, have OpenStack up and running magically. It is a little bit more complicated than that. It is, however, an extensible framework that really allows you to build the cloud platform that you, uh, that you need. So if we look at the, the OpenStack architecture, we basically have commodity x86 hardware powering the OpenStack uh, platform. There's a common network that we, that we build these services on. And for every typical uh, OpenStack implementation, there's a couple of things that you need. You need a compute environment, you need some storage, which can be file, block, and object storage. Um, and then you need a dashboard or something to, to interact with, this, uh, with the system. There's an OpenStack control plane that runs all these services like authentication, um, uh, some of the, 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 the message queuing services, etc. And then we expose the APIs out of this platform for your applications to use, and also for things like the graphic user interface, uh, if you want to use the Horizon uh, interface for that, and the API for some monitoring and other, and other tools. And what I'll be doing, if the demo guards are, are with me this morning, um, I'll actually show you how we, how we build some stuff automatically uh, in OpenStack. In terms of what OpenStack can, uh, can automate, there's a massive amount of projects inside the OpenStack uh, community. Typically, what we do is we, open, is we um, orchestrate uh, compute resources, um, storage backup recovery using Swift and Cinder for block and object storage. Um, networking is obviously a very key portion of this with the OpenStack Neutron project. We're starting to see Designate as a, a DNS management um, project starting to become a lot more uh, popular. And then for guys doing uh, applications, uh, the Trove project delivering Database as a service, um, either based on SQL or NoSQL databases, is also gaining uh, rapid momentum. Security, identity has always been part of this. Um, Keystone is the authentication method that we use inside uh, OpenStack between the OpenStack services. Uh, you can backend that uh, onto any LDAP um, capable directory or some, something like um, Microsoft Active Directory. Barbican is an um, authentication key management platform. Uh, it's fairly new. Um, starting to gain some traction as well. And then, of course, the management tools that allow you to interact with, uh, with OpenStack. Verizon being the, uh, the dashboard interface for that. Um, Rally, which does some testing to make sure things work as they should. And, of course, all the OpenStack CLI, CLI tools. Um, from a development point of view, uh, from a deployment tool set po point of view, uh, it really is a case of choose your weapon. There's uh, pre-built configurations and things for most of the popular um, deployment tools out there. Ansible is becoming really, really popular. Uh, Juju that we use from Canonical is, uh, is quite pop uh, popular as well. If we look at application services, um, Heat obviously is the, is the, the dashboard, but Zakwar is a message queuing service, very similar to Amazon's SNS 
uh, type service where you can um, have a message queue as a service for your mobile applications, for instance, and Murano, which offers an application uh, catalog. And finally, for, for monitoring and metering, we have projects like Solometer, which makes metering data available. You can consume that data within your application to trigger events. Um, if your web server is running at 70% load, trigger a process to automatically spin up more web servers, uh, dynamically put them uh, behind your load balancing pool, uh, etc. So just some factoids about, um, about OpenStack. And Flavio earlier this morning touched uh, a little bit uh, on this. There's currently 46 projects uh, in active development that make up the OpenStack project. If we add the things that are currently uh, in, in, in incubation, it's probably just about 60, 65. Um, it is the largest open source project at the moment, um, and it is 100% developed in, uh, in Python, which is, which is great. For the latest release of, uh, of OpenStack, there's about 7,000 software engineers which contributed code as, uh, as individuals, and an additional code base coming from about 320 customers. Um, these companies uh, include the likes of Walmart, which on their own have about 7,000 engineers working on OpenStack as a, as a project. It is very mature technology. Um, we like to think that OpenStack is brand new. It's about 10 years, 10 years old. Um, currently, the 16th release pike is actually uh, available at the, um, at the moment. Um, I would say don't install on pike immediately. Ricotta is currently, uh, currently where it's at. And there's a big third-party ecosystem around, uh, around OpenStack. So it's not only the 46 projects and the things in incubation, all the major vendors that you can think of in the enterprise space, uh, brand new vendors are building technology that fits around the, uh, the OpenStack uh, project. People are always interested to know who runs OpenStack. You know, is the stuff in production in some environments? You know, what are guys doing with it? Um, so there's, if you go to the openstack.org website forward slash user stories, you'll find tons and tons of good references, uh, banking services, uh, retail, you know, guys like PayPal, Walmart, BMW, etc. Um, I was in, in, in Prague at the SUSCON conference uh, last week, and BMW actually did a, um, a case study about their two-year journey in terms of running uh, OpenStack as the internal IT platform. They estimate that they have a 20% cost saving even over their Chinese competitors from an internal IT point of view by running OpenStack. And on a development platform with 24 compute nodes, they create and destroy 100,000 virtual machines um, per month with an average lifetime per machine of around uh, 10 hours or so. So quite interesting stuff uh, in how they do that. If you want to get certified on, uh, on OpenStack, there is now certification training uh, available. I believe that... Um, uh, guys like Jumping Beanie and Cape Town are going to hop on that quite quickly so you can get certified. And the project is very well documented. So docs.openstack.org, everything that you need uh, is there. Even for guys like us um, running an OpenStack powered public cloud, we point our customers to, the, to this documentation. We deliver as pure an OpenStack um, service as we possibly can. OpenStack has got many, many use cases, but for the audience today, I'm going to focus a little bit on what it takes to build a cloud that you can use for software uh, development and engineering. The first thing that we need there is we need to put something down that gives us the basic building blocks of cloud services. So we need to have storage computer networking, uh, networking down. That's the basics. Um, depending on what you want to do from an orchestration point of view, we'd recommend that you install OpenStack Heat, which uses the heat orchestration template uh, structure. I'll actually demonstrate that uh, this morning. Um, so that you can use APIs to rapidly provision applications and, and, uh, and services. Uh, container technology is massively popular at the moment. You've got a couple of options there around orchestration. Um, Docker and Kubernetes obviously work quite well together. There is also an OpenStack uh, project Magnum for container orchestration if you want to, uh, want to use that. And then for your older legacy applications, or we want to put OpenStack uh, or containers onto bare metal, there is the OpenStack Ironic project that allows you to, open, uh, to orchestrate your physical tin in the same way that you would do with virtual machines or, uh, or containers. Um, database as a service, the Trove project for SQL or NoSQL databases, um, the simple messaging service that I spoke about earlier, and then of course again, your favorite DevOps tools that you want to, uh, that you want to use. Um, 
what's nice about this is you can build systems uh, using OpenStack that's highly portable. You can take these applications and you can go and deploy them in Amazon Web Services, Google, uh, Azure, etc. So a question we always get is how does OpenStack compare to traditional enterprise virtualization, the tools that guys would normally you normally find in an IT data center? Um, key thing is there is obviously no licensing fees. You can get commercial support if you want to. Um, just check out the, the vendors have some different models in how they provide um, uh, professional services support around OpenStack. Some guys will charge you per CPU socket. Some guys will charge you per node regardless of its role. So when you make this choice to, to for mission critical OpenStack platforms, get commercial support. Just make sure that you check um, the financial services model to make sure that, uh, it, it's what you need. We obviously build on commodity x86 hardware. Please don't go and, and buy expensive blade chassis and fiber channel storage, etc. You buy um, brands like Supermicro, Dell, HP, um, commodity x86 server hardware is what you need. We do everything uh, software defined. The same goes for the switching architectures. If you brave, you can get like really cheap um, white label switches. 48, 10, 48 port uh, 10 gig devices and you can stick open source network operating systems like uh, Cumulus uh, on that. It works extremely well. Don't go and spend fortunes on uh, big brand name stuff. Uh, some of the benefits from this is that everything that we do in OpenStack is API driven, which means that you can take tools and you can bend this cloud and this infrastructure to your will as you, um, uh, as you see fit. Unlike commercial products, you can extend OpenStack by just deploying the, the projects and the services that you need. We find that with the commercial tools, you're pretty much stuck with what the vendor gives you. Unless you, you know, do feature requests which might take 18 months, you're pretty much going to sit with what the same platform as what everybody else uh, has. Um, the rapid feature velocity is a, is a big thing in, the, uh, in this community. It is a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, there's a new release of OpenStack every six months. I uh, previously mentioned that OpenStack and upgrades are two tough words in the, same, in the same sentence. I would say that from the OpenStack Newton release, doing rolling upgrades has become a lot uh, easier. But it is a challenge to deal with the fact that every six months there is a full new release of OpenStack uh, that is available. Of course, OpenStack is open source. You get to look at the code. You can make changes, improvements, upstream, all the good benefits that we get from, uh, from open source. And finally, no vendor lock-in. We've seen so many customers deploy OpenStack uh, in commercial environments who simply by saving the money on maintenance on their traditional enterprise kit can pay for a full uh, high availability OpenStack uh, system. How do we build OpenStack? So the first choice that you really need to make, and I'm assuming that we're building for high availability so that you know, this platform is always up and available is whether you're going to build the classic model for OpenStack, where we pull the services apart so that you can scale them uh, independently, or whether we are going to go for a hyper-converged um, type platform where your server hardware are basically identical nodes and you spread your services uh, around. We're seeing that for guys uh, building out OpenStack the first time, the hyper-converged model seems to be very popular. It also requires a bit less uh, server hardware to get, uh, to get going. For high availability um, on the OpenStack classic method, you basically require 15 servers, which sounds like a, like a lot, um, with three different hardware specs um, between the storage control and, and compute nodes. Um, if you build HA on um, uh, hyperconverged, you require about uh, 12 machines. You can get OpenStack running on a lot less hardware. And please, when you try OpenStack, get it running on maybe a single server um, if you have a laptop with 16 or 32 gigs of RAM, you can get um, basic dev stack uh, up and running. What we're talking about here is production quality, um, enterprise grade deployments of, uh, of OpenStack. Um, again, choose your deployment tool. Uh, Juju is used by uh, Canonical, uh, Salt, the SUSE Linux guys, Red Hat uses Ansible. So depending on your distribution, you'll have some, uh, some choices there. In terms of the server, or the, the switching hardware rather, 48-port, uh, 10-gig Ethernet switches, um, and like I said, you can get commercial um, uh, white box switches for, uh, for that. For the out-of-band management stuff, go and dig up in your uh, old IT closet, 
Go and grab those uh, one gig switches that you threw away two, three years ago. They work fine for out of band management. You don't need anything, uh, anything more than that. Um, I mentioned the brands of servers uh, previously, specifically Dell, HP, and Supermicro. Uh, these servers are extremely well supported uh, in the OpenStack community. There's pre built bill of materials for pretty much all of these brands uh, from all the major OpenStack uh, distributors, making it really easy to decide how you want to build your, uh, your platform. Um, just in terms of how we run uh, our compute nodes in our own uh, environment for production, Typically, our nodes have 768 gigs of RAM uh, per compute node. We run 14-core Xeon E5 uh, processors. We find that this scales in our production cloud nice and linear for how we consume RAM uh, as well as processor. You can obviously oversell the, the processor capability inside your OpenStack environment. I would recommend that you not oversell or over, um, over uh, not overspec overcommit your, uh, your RAM resources, um, run that on a one-to-one one, uh, one one ratio. Um, you're looking for trouble if you try and overcommit uh, on, the, uh, on the RAM side of things. And then just in general for the, the, the roles of nodes that we deploy, uh, on the one side we have the control node infrastructure, typically not as beefy machines that run the, uh, the services to m that makes OpenStack uh, tick. Compute nodes are typically heavy resource machines. They do all the heavy lifting in terms of uh, uh, the plane that we run. Storage monitors. Um, storage monitors and storage OSD nodes really comes into play when you run Ceph as your software-defined storage architecture. Uh, Ceph is extremely well supported in the community. So in order to make Ceph work, you've got some control monitors that run the crush map computations for where we place data inside the, uh, the cluster. It also makes sure that um, when you do the data replication, that no single um, piece of the data resides on the same infrastructure. So it's not shared on the same drive, the same controller, or the same node. So if you have component failure in your storage environment, your platform just keeps on running while you replace uh, the, broken, the broken hardware. The storage OSD nodes are typically drive-rich um, servers. Each drive runs an object store daemon. Um, and that's how we make sure that we have this uh, fantastic load distribution inside the platform. So, I told you I'm going to do a, a demo, so uh, let, me jump into, uh, let me jump into this. So what I'm going to show you first is just what the OpenStack Verizon dashboard looks like. And for this particular demo, what we're going to do, I'm going to spin up some, some infrastructure to get us to a Django web application, a little Hello World app that, we, um, that we're running. So as you can see just over here uh, at the moment, our OpenStack environment is empty. We've literally got nothing inside this OpenStack project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off this Python uh, file, and I'll take you through what it does. Um, in order to create everything in your OpenStack environment, it takes about eight minutes, so we should um, have enough time to get that to get that going. So, what we're doing is um, the demo script that we that we're running goes into the OpenStack environment via CLI, and it creates a heat orchestration template. The template basically defines what are the OpenStack services that we are going to require. So for this particular demo that we're doing, we want to build a web server. In order to do that, we need to have a network for that server to, to connect to. We want to make it publicly accessible, so we are going to plug that network onto a router that is connected onto the, uh, the internet. Once we have that infrastructure in place and the server is up and running, we are going to grab a public IP address out of the, the public pool and assign it to that uh, machine. Once the machine is up and running, we are going to run a little script that will update all the uh, software on that, uh, on that virtual machine. It will then pull down Ansible, and once Ansible is installed on the machine, we are going to execute an Ansible playbook. The Ansible playbook will, re will deploy all the key requirements and dependencies for us to get the Nginx web server up and running. And once that's going, we're going to deploy uh, the Django framework uh, on, top of, uh, on top of that. Um, if you want to go and try this uh, yourself, by the way, we've got the uh, JetUp um, uh, link up, uh, up there. You can go and create a, uh, a tenant on our environment, pull the code, just change your user credentials, and go and play and see how this, uh, how this works. 
Um, just in terms of Python, for how we use this, we integrate all the Python clients um, onto, the, the, open st uh, onto the, the local machine. So that we interact um, using the, um, the actual uh, uh, Python clients. In order to build infrastructure in OpenStack, what OpenStack presents you once you've created a, uh, a user is it gives you an empty virtual data center. It's not like with other tools where you spin up a virtual machine. You, l you have to really put everything in place to get it done. It gives you a lot of flexibility for building multiple networks, segmenting stuff, setting security rules and groups, doing micro-segmentation between virtual machines, etc. So the workflow for getting this done is inside OpenStack you need to create a key pair. We do authentication using, uh, SSH, uh, well, using key pairs over, over SSH, and you use that same key pair to decrypt Windows passwords, which we randomly generate for machines if you want to spin up a Microsoft uh, platform. You then create your internal uh, network. Um, at that point, you decide if you want that network connected to the internet or not, and if, and if you do, you create your virtual, your virtual router. Next step is just to define how you're going to limit access to and from the internet onto these virtual machines that you create. Security groups, think of them as layer four firewall uh, services. So you can um, stick a bunch of rules inside a security group. For the demo this morning, we're going to uh, create a group that allows us to ping the server. It'll open up port 80 and port 443 for us to connect uh, to that machine. You can have one security group with lots of rules, or you can have one security group per rule, your choice for how you do it. Once that's done, you create your, uh, you create your virtual machine. Uh, on creation of the virtual machine, you set the security groups for the access to that individual machine, and once it's spinning, you assign a public IP address on it. Once you've got that in place, your machine can now connect out to the internet, it can pull updates, you've got a route back to it uh, from, the, uh, from the internet. So let's go and have a look inside Horizon, what has happened in the... Uh, in the meantime, so if I just refresh the uh, the instance page over here, if my Vodacom connection works, you'll see that we now have, we, we previously had an empty piece of infrastructure. We now have a server called Server 1, which is up and running. We created an internal network, which I'll show you in a moment, wh where the machine has an internal uh, private network address, and we've grabbed an IP address out of the pool. So I'm just going to highlight that bad boy. Um, we also selected the Gen 1 medium flavor, so we're running this on a machine with two virtual CPUs uh, and four gigs of RAM, 50 gigs of, uh, of disk. Uh, a little bit overkill for what we're trying to do, but it, it works. And the machine is active, and it is running, and it has been running for the, past, for the past three minutes or so. It's also been placed in our Johannesburg Availability Zone 1, so you can set where you want machines created, or you can just let the scheduler put it into any zone that is available. On the network topology side, just to show you what the, what the infrastructure looks, with, uh, looks like now. Um, incidentally, when we do this, we talk live to the APIs and we pull, up the, uh, we pull up the information. So what we have over here is we have our public internet, which is connected to our public router, which in turn is connected to our demo network where our demo server is, uh, is connected. So we've built all this infrastructure over the, past, over the past three minutes. If we look at the orchestration site, uh, we created this OpenStack heat template um, inside, the, uh, inside the environment. And if we just look at that for a moment, the stack itself has got a, a lot of uh, definition in there for what, we, for what we're doing. So we've obviously set security groups on that uh, virtual machine so that we know what the access requirement is. We've set up an IP address for this uh, particular device, and then we've um, configured um, the compute server to, to run this machine. You get all the information that you use on the API, so all the IDs and things for the infrastructure is defined via this or um, retrieved via this uh, uh, demo template. It also shows you the, uh, the resources that, it, that it's consuming again with the, with the IDs, showing you what's on the network side and on the compute side. Uh, the event lock is there, so that you can go and debug if, you, if your stack isn't executing properly for some other reason. And then the actual template file that we use is in here, so that you can see exactly how we coded, how we coded that, um, that template. 
we use containers for uh, public um, object store. So if you deploy this inside your environment, you get an Amazon S3 compliant uh, object store, a little bit like Dropbox that you can, uh, that you can use. Um, and on the access and security side, this is where we set um, the security groups. So for this particular security group that we dynamically created, um, we created lots of things to say, we'll allow traffic out of the network. And for traffic back into the network, we're only allowing ICMP so that we can ping that server. Uh, port 22 for SSH so that we can securely connect to it. And we've opened up the web ports uh, on that particular machine. We also, from this, um, uh, from this location, come on, Varacom. <laughs> we have our key pairs that we, uh, that we use. And we can see over here the floating IP that we grabbed out of the pool and how it is mapped to a particular server's uh, private address. And this is the, the good stuff. This is where we publish all the APIs out of OpenStack um, to consume. You can download the resource file from here um, to put that on your local machine. You can view your credentials from here. And if you want to use Juju, uh, which we do with um, Ubuntu, you can get the environment file for that uh, as well, allowing you to, pre to deploy pre-built um, applications. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly go to the web page here yeah, and just see what is up and running. Okay, so what we've done in this entire thing now is we've created all the virtual infrastructure, we updated the image, we downloaded and installed uh, Ansible, we executed the Ansible playbook, we installed all the software, etc. And the end result is that we've got this little Hello World application up and running. And I'll just prove to you that it is, uh, in fact, Django that we're running. And there we go. And that, uh, that concludes my presentation. OK, we have time for some questions. If you have a question, wait for the mic to arrive. Hi. Um, I work for a traditional oil and grease engineering company. So excuse if this is a, uh, not a good question. Um, OpenStack, wh where, where does it fit in? Is, do you install OpenStack on the server, or do you install Ubuntu on the server and install OpenStack on the server? Or OK, or so, so on the bare metal hardware that you get, so on the, on the server, you install um, an Ubuntu operating system. In our case, you can also do SUSE Linux, uh, OpenSUSE, Red Hat, CentOS, whatever your, your flavor is. You basically install that on, on the machine, and on that, you start building the OpenStack, uh, the OpenStack services. You also have machines for different roles, so you'll designate some machines for compute nodes, some for storage, or you can build hyperconverged all the resources on a single on a single machine. So, so if we've got a customer with factories in two different countries, um, and they can provision us with a Red Hat server or whatever they've got, we can install OpenStack and run. Absolutely, um, and in fact, what would happen is when you look at the the login screen over here on uh, on OpenStack, um, what you would get from here is the moment you have multi-region deployments, you would have an additional option on the screen where you can select the region that you want to log into. So your user could be part of multiple, multiple tenants in multiple regions at the end of the day. So when you look at it over here, I've got our automation demo, but I can also log into my Cloudify demo or my customer demo uh, tenant. And that could be split via any uh, region as well. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, kind of a two-part question. First, you mentioned Kubernetes. Are you yes. looking at OpenShift, considering you're already working with OpenStack? And then the second thing, have you looked at Packer? So you were saying Ansible's provisioning everything, but you could use Packer to build a base image and then Ansible just configuring the cons afterwards. Absolutely. So um, like I said, you've got loads of, um, loads of choices for how you want to do it. Um, in terms of offering platform as a service, which is really where OpenShift plays. Um, OpenShift is limited in that it only installs on Red Hat, on Red Hat operating systems. So when you look at our, um, and this you can do again um, on any OpenStack deployment, um, we certainly provide you with um, a whole bunch of flavors that you, can, that you can deploy on. So if you want to run OpenShift, 
You've got CentOS 6 and 7 in here. There could be RHEL in here, so you'd build the basic Red Hat Enterprise Linux server, and on top of that, you would install uh, OpenShift. There is a difference between running, you can run OpenShift for your tenant, so it's only available for you, or the next step for this, uh, for us, is to offer container as a service, where you don't have to go and build all that infrastructure. You simply uh, consume it as a service on, uh, on our side. Thank you. Um, I've got a question uh, slightly more technical. Um, so I'm more familiar with Open Nebula, um, and some of the work we do is with like PCI device pass-through, so SRIOV. Yeah. Um, how does uh, OpenStack handle that? Is it built in, like baked into the... Yeah. yeah. So uh, SRIOV is, a, is an option that you can select at deployment, uh, at deployment time. Uh, you also have the option of uh, selecting uh, DPDK. So um, the nice thing about this is you can actually run certain services directly on the, on the silicon, on the network, on the network cards as well. Uh, as well. We use DPDK on our own platform, um, so we run Intel uh, X-series chipsets on the network cards, and we make them do the, uh, all the hard work. But selecting SRIOV is just simply a deployment option um, on your pre-built deployment uh, template. Um, sorry, the, um, this is just a comment on, on, on your question on using Packer. Um, so, the reason why this was built specifically using Ansible is it was built on a clean, on a, on a very minimal OS. Um, whereas, yes, you could go to, a, you could build out the marketplace, but then trusting your sources becomes very difficult because you're not sure what, what's been mutated from the source. So, this was actually built using a very minimal OS, uh, everything basically built from, from the minimal OS provided. Well, well, you could build them, but... Uh, yeah, I think maybe just to, maybe just to clarify that. Um, the operating system images we, um, we provide are unmolested. We don't go and make any changes, any changes to them. Um, y y you know, um, we, we, actually don't even, uh, we actually don't even put that in the machine. You literally get from the cloud image repository from these various vendors is where we make the, the pools for these, uh, for these images. Um, to change the, uh, the deployment tools like Ansible inside that is a choice that you make and you deploy that on the, uh, uh, on the machine. Hi there. Um, my question is about uh, your deployment of your hardware. Do you use Metal as a service or are you, how do you go about deploying your, 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 your cluster? Sure, absolutely. We use Met, uh, Metal as a service. Um, in, our, in our environment, we use uh, MOS, the Ubuntu Metal as a service uh, platform. There's also other tools like uh, Crowbar that you can use for the same, for the same thing. Um, in the way that we run it in our environment, when we insert, uh, we, we physically just cable up a brand new blank server in the, in the environment. And when that server gets pulsed for, uh, for the hardware boot, it actually picks your boots from the MOS server the MOS server then identifies the hardware in the machine, and based on a pre-built uh, profile, that machine gets designated as either storage node, control node, compute node, etc. And once it's identified, it automatically kick, kicks off the installation process to turn that machine into whatever role it is selected. So it's really click in, power on, and you walk away, and, it, and the capacity gets added to the OpenStack environment. Uh, we have time for one more question. I have a very quick one. Um, sure. So you were talking about the price, uh, you know, all the, the, the kit and so forth. This, I don't know if you're going to have an answer for this, but obviously AWS is very popular in the space of infrastructure. At what point does it become cost effective to switch from a service like AWS to uh, your own cloud infrastructure? Okay, so there's, there's two parts to that, uh, to that question. One is that when you build this environment locally and you've incurred the capital cost, then you basically have a fixed cost for your resources. Whereas our international uh, compatriots, competitors, charge you in US dollars. So there's always the risk of price fluctuation. So you always have to keep an eye on that, that, that crossover point shifts. In general, when your environment goes beyond a certain enterprise size, it actually does become cheaper to build, uh, to build it yourself. And you would have seen it even large guys like Netflix 
started off on Amazon AWS and then went their own, their own data center route. Um, if you have low resource requirements, don't go and build OpenStack, rent OpenStack. You know, get it from guys like us, Rackspace, etc. Um, you know, get some stuff from Amazon and Google uh, and these guys. But if you, you know, we've got customers with uh, governance and compliance specific, um, specifically requirements where they build OpenStack uh, internally. And when they c uh, amortize the cost over a certain period of time, it is actually cheaper than using uh, some of these public cloud uh, resources. Okay, let's thank our speakers. A few quick announcements.